Thank you. A distinct pleasure to welcome to the podium Professor Matthew Stylin. So we heard from Mary Beth Taker already, okay? From a lawyer's perspective, the reason the case Tinker versus Des Moines is significant is because it gave us the current rule governing student speech in school. And that rule is basically this. A school may not suppress or punish student speech unless school officials have reason to believe that the speech will materially and substantially disrupt the school. A lot of words in the law, right? Okay? The school official has to have a reason to think they're going to screw things up. If they don't, they can't suppress the speech, they cannot punish the speech. Okay, so distilled to its essence, the rule's pretty simple, but the problem is in applying the rule. And applying the rule becomes complicated. That is always what happens in the law. So we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean materially and substantially disrupt? What is included in a material disruption? What is excluded? If what you say causes other people to comment, oh my God, you hear what I'm now? Causes other people to snicker, causes other people to warn you, don't say that. That is not a material and substantial disruption. How do I know that? Well, that happened in Tinker, and the Supreme Court said the speech was protected for the same reason. If um, what you say distracts another student from their work, that does not count as a material and substantial disruption. Well, what does count then? According to a case decided after Tinker called Papish versus University of Missouri, if you use a swear word, I know none of you ever swear, but if you happen to have like a crazy moment and swear in the student newspaper, okay, that would not count as a material and substantial disruption, at least at the university. In a case after Papish, though, called Fraser, Bethel School District versus Fraser, the Supreme Court refused even to apply the Tinker Rule to a student who gave a speech at a school assembly in which he made a bunch of really gross comments about sexuality. So make sure you understand what I'm saying. The Supreme Court didn't apply the Tinker Rule, material and substantial disruption, and conclude that talking about sex at a school assembly is disruptive. They didn't even apply the rule. They basically treated the speech as completely unprotected. And then in a case much more recently, Morse versus Frederick, Frederick um, the court also uh, refused to apply the Tinker Rule to a student banner that read, you, you've read about this, right, somewhat bizarrely, bong hits for Jesus, Woohoo! bong hits for Jesus. The court did not even apply Tinker to that speech, basically treating advocacy of consumption of illegal drugs at a school event as unprotected under the First Amendment. So, where does that leave us? Are you confused yet? I am. So, I hope you are confused. Or if you're not, maybe you want to come back up here and tell the rest of the class how to make sense of this. Let's just review. We've got a basic rule tinker. Your speech is protected unless school officials have reason to believe it will cause a material and substantial disruption. And then we have a bunch of exceptions to that rule. The first ex exception being unless you use sexually indecent speech at a school assembly. The second exception being if you advocate illegal drug use at a school event. But why do we have these exceptions? And are there any other exceptions? I mean, that's what we got to figure out, right? Let me give you some examples. What if you advocate in a class discussion that New York ought to legalize marijuana? We've been talking about that, right? Is that fall under the illegal drug exception? What if you advocate resisting the police? Now, resisting the police is going to get you arrested, and it might be illegal. Does that mean it ought to be protected, a protected form of conduct that is to advocate resisting the police? What if you advocate nonviolent civil disobedience? Hey, that's illegal by definition. But of course, we have a proud tradition of nonviolent civil disobedience. We heard about it earlier today. What if you advocate 
What if you advocate violent civil disobedience? Oh, well, we had a revolution that our forefathers fought. You heard about James Otis giving his five-hour lecture, right? So is there no room for violent disobedience? Is advocacy of violent disobedience protected speech or not? Well, who, who knows, okay? In the next 15 minutes, I'm going to tell you a story that's going to help answer some of these questions, okay? The story I'm going to tell you is a little bit different from what you've heard so far. It's a story about the evolution of our law. I'm not going to begin with Tinker. I'm going to end with Tinker. And the reasons for approaching the matter this way is that I want to give you a sense of why the court decided the case in Tinker the way it did. Once you have a grasp on the reasons for the court's decision in Tinker, you'll have a sense of its limits, how far you can go in being subversive in your speech in school, and where the line is because there is a line. Now I'm going to divide my talk up into three sections or what I call chapters. And those correspond to the parts of the title of the talk. So remember, it's speech, free speech, school speech. Chapter one, section one of my talk is about speech. And I'm going to start by telling you in chapter one about how national and state governments treated speech around the time the Constitution was adopted, about 250 years ago. It's not what you'd expect. So chapter one is about speech. Chapter two is about free speech. It's about the origin of our modern day protections of subversive political speech. And then chapter three is about school speech. It's about the time in which we apply these principles to the context of the school. Okay, all right? Do we need another stand-up break? I'm get a little bit of dead face. Do this, okay? Deep breath. Okay, chapter one. <laughs> Some of you, are like, you don't actually have to slap yourself in the face. Okay, chapter one. Chapter one is about speech, and in particular, the government regulation of speech around the time of the adoption of our Constitution. Now, I've, um, you've already heard today uh, about the First Amendment to the Constitution, which states that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. But the natural follow-up question is, What's the freedom of speech? Okay, so Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. What is that thing? For the men who adopted the amendment, the freedom of speech did not, did not mean the freedom to speak and write as you wanted without consequence. There was no such tradition in England or in the American colonies. The weight of the evidence suggests instead that leading Americans believed that speech could be harmful, even dangerous and that the state had a duty to protect all of us from dangerous speech by punishing the offender. Now, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Some of you may know, in studying for history and preparing for history exams, that the state of New York was the site of some of the most brutal and sustained conflict during the Revolutionary War, right? New York City, in particular, was captured by the British right at the beginning of the war in the summer of 76 after the Battle of Long Island and the British held New York City for six years, almost the entire duration of the war, until late in 1783 on what's called Evacuation Day. But what made the war especially painful for New Yorkers were the internal divisions that it brought out. New York was full of what we called loyalists. You know what that term means? Loyalists, right? Loyalists are Americans who chose not to advocate for independence but remain loyal to whom? to the king, because they were British subjects, loyalists. New York was full of these loyalists. And then the revolutionaries in New York, who called themselves patriots, or hilariously Whigs, okay, that comes out of English political tradition, they called themselves Whigs, like the thing you put on your head. Okay? The Whigs were extre extremely distrustful of the loyalists. When they seized control of New York government, they ordered them to leave their homes, they ordered the Loyalists to cross the battle lines, the lines where the British and American armies were face-to-face, were -face, and seek the protection of the British. They also stripped all remaining New York Loyalists of the right to vote, the right to hold elected office, the right to sue in a court of law, the right to practice their professions, and most importantly, our great American patriots strip the New York Loyalists of their right to speak on the single most important issue of the day, which was independence. Let me give you an example of how this worked. They made friends turn informant on one another. So you'd have friends report on neighbors who'd raise a glass of beer to toast to the health of the king. You ever heard this? Like, long live the king, right? 
if someone saw you doing this, they might report that speech. We had something, and this is real, we had something called the Committee for Detecting Conspiracies. So such speech could be reported to the Committee for Detecting Conspiracies, and the Committee for Detecting Conspiracies had the power to arrest you and bring you before it and interrogate you about the time you raised a glass of beer to the health of the king. Who is the head of this crazy com committee for detecting conspiracies? Have you ever heard of John Jay? John Jay was a founding father. He was a second governor of the state of New York and the first chief justice of its high court. John Jay had men arrested and interrogated for toasting to the health of the king. Even worth, uh, worse than this, about halfway through the course of the war in spring of 1781, the New York Assembly passed a law entitled an act, quote, to punish adherence to the King of Great Britain, which made it a crime, and here's the language from the statute, made it a crime to preach, teach, speak, or write that the king had any authority over New York. Preaching, teaching, speaking, writing that the king had authority over New York was made a felony, and do you know how felonies were punished at that time? By death. So if you want to advocate that the king has authority over New York, what happens to you in revolutionary New York? You die. I don't know about you, but it struck me as extremely surprising to learn about these laws. But what happened when I started to study the matter more, more thoroughly is that I discovered that it was actually part of a significant English tradition. Although these statutes had a bunch of different names, the crime they defined was usually called sedition or seditious libel. Have you ever heard of that? Seditious libel. It's like treason, but it's treason light. Okay, the thrust of seditious libel is to use your words to undermine the authority of the state. And unlike ordinary libel, where you say something false about someone and you get sued because it hurts the reputation, unlike ordinary libel, truth was not a defense to seditious libel. It didn't make it any better that, hey, what I said was true. Truth made it worse because truth made the speech more dangerous. So in revolutionary times, you could be convicted of a felony for speaking truly but critically about revolutionary New York. Okay, well, what about the First Amendment? We've heard a lot about the First Amendment. Didn't this change this? Did the First Amendment prohibit punishment of seditious speech? Well, it doesn't, think, it doesn't actually seem like it did. Take, for example, the first major war scare in the history of our country. This is around the year 1800 when the United States was drawn into a conflict between Great Britain and France. Congress's response to this wartime situation was to pass a law that made it a crime to, quote, write, print, utter, or publish any false, scandalous, and malicious writing against the government of the United States. It made that crime punishable by imprisonment. Ten years after we adopted the First Amendment, Congress passed a law making criticism of the government a crime. Okay, so that's chapter one. Okay, you're a third of the way there. That's chapter one. Remember, my claim was in chapter one that at the time the First Amendment was adopted, there was little protection for seditious libel or other forms of subversive political speech. If you criticize the government, you're gonna find yourself in jail or worse. Okay, chapter one. Now, chapter two. Chapter two, remember, is free speech. Okay, so we know today that the First Amendment protects political speech. When did that happen? Fast forward 100 years from the year 1800 to the First World War, which begins in 1914. Okay, it was an uncertain time, mighty times. Okay, at home we faced serious threats from radical dissident groups. Let me give you an example. In May of 1920, anarchists, here's a group you don't hear much from these days, anarchists bombed Wall Street, killing 30 people, which was the most deadly terrorist attack on American soil up to the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995. In May of 1918, while World War I was still ongoing, Congress passed an act criminalizing, and I'll quote from the statute, publication of disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the form of the government of the United States, or its constitution, or its military, or the military's uniform, or the American flag. You now know the proper legal term for this kind of statute. What is it? It's seditious libel. And the act, in fact, is known as the Sedition Act of 1918. A series of high-profile 
court cases come before the Supreme Court in which the Sedition Act and its sister statutes are tested. And at first, the court upholds these acts. But in 1919, the most prominent member of the court, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., dissents in a case called Abrams versus United States. And the core of his dissent, here's where I need your attention, okay? The core of his dissent was what you might call a theory of the role of subversive speech in our political system. Holmes began by observing that some people never doubt that what they believe is true. You know people like this? Some people think everything they just happen to think is some God-given message. They think it's absolutely true. And Holmes said those people naturally seek to encode what they believe into law so they can, and here's his language, sweep away all opposition. Holmes contrasted those people to other people whom he said have come to realize that, and here's his language, time has upset many fighting faiths. In other words, that what seemed necessary or special or crucial or true today was not, in fact, that tomorrow. And that the best way to reach the truth was what Holmes called a free trade in ideas. Holmes said this is, and this is his language, this is the theory of our Constitution. It is an experiment, as all life is an experiment. I think we should be vigilant against attempts to check the expression of opinions that we loathe. As he put it in another decision, we should only check subversive speech when it poses a clear and present danger. Have you ever heard that term? It's like the title of like 25 movies. This is Holmes. Holmes came up with that language. You have the right to speak subversively until and unless it poses a clear and present danger until to our national security. Now, the, the rule's been changed somewhat since then, but the thrust of it's the same. Now, notice that Holmes called this the theory of our Constitution. You know now, one of the things you know as a result of this speech, that that was not the theory of our Constitution as it was originally understood. It was Holmes's theory, but still, it was a brilliant theory. What he understood was that our system of government is not put at risk by subversive political speech. On the contrary, what Holmes called a free trade in ideas made our government stronger. How? How does allowing criticism make the government stronger? Because it allows you to challenge those who are in, who are in power to examine their views, exposing error where they didn't see any error. Notice what the theory assumes. Focus here. Notice what the theory assumes. At its core is a free trade in ideas, a trade in ideas. To trade ideas, what do you have to do? You express yourself, you wait for someone to respond, and then you reply to the response. In other words, Holmes's point was not that we should allow subversive speech just because, hey, it's great to let people express how they feel inside because everyone's super special. I mean, hey, that might be true, but that wasn't Holmes's idea. Holmes's idea was that speech was valuable because it led to deliberation. The point is to stand up for what you think, to stand behind it, to own it, to take responsibility for it. If you do that, then it pushes us towards the truth, or what Holmes called the ultimate good. And it distinguishes subversive political speech from simply trying to hurt people with what you're saying or trying to incite crime. Okay, so that's the end of chapter two. We've come finally to chapter three, school speech. So when do the principles of free political speech come into the school? Well, not with Justice Holmes, which might surprise you. To my knowledge, the issue of speech in school never came before Justice Holmes, but I think if it had, he almost certainly would have found that you have no right to free speech. You've heard that tinker is important because it says you're persons, you have rights, and we all kind of chuckle, well, of course you are, right? But the assumption was you aren't. Okay, so why? Why would Holmes, the great Holmes, have rejected the idea that you have a right to speak in school? Well, the basic reason is because he considered what, he considered what the law called, he considered public school what the law called a privilege, not a right. A privilege was something freely given by government. And you had to accept the privilege just as it was given. Let me give an example. In the case of McAuliffe versus City of New Bedford, Holmes rejected a man's request to be reinstated to his position as a police officer. He had been fired for engaging in political activity, which was against police department rules. And the man said, you're punishing me for my First Amendment rights. 
Holmes said, no. And he gave one of his most famous quips. He said, you have a right to speak on political matters, but you have no right to be a policeman. In other words, your right to be a policeman, your right to your job, rested on you agreeing to give up some of your freedom of speech, to accept certain limits. Police departments have to be this way. Think about it. Could a police department function if an officer could say whatever he wanted on any topic at any time? It'd be like total chaos. Now, it's easy to think about how this applies to the school. Would school work, as much as you'd like it if it'd be this way, would school work if you could talk about whatever you want, whenever you want, who cares what the teacher says, right? School would not work that way. School would not work that way. Public school is offered for free by our government on the condition that students and teachers accept certain basic rules. The school simply could not function if students were allowed to speak whenever they wanted on whatever they want. Okay, now, we've come to the part in our talk, which is my favorite, which is, features a second judicial hero, and that's our own Robert Jackson, who, excuse me, you've heard a lot about already. Jackson, as it happens, is responsible for translating Holmes' theory of the free trade of ideas into the context of a public school. What Jackson saw was that public schools were training grounds for young men and women, taught them how to be participants in this free trade and ideas. Schools were, you might put it, the petri dish of democracy. Jackson laid out this vision in a really famous case called West Virginia versus Barnett, which dealt with whether a state could require students to salute the American flag. And it was a super creepy salute. They do it like this. I, okay, if you don't have a sense that something's wrong with that, I think you, <laughs> but that's the way that the salute was required. And Jackson held that that violated the First Amendment. And on his way to that conclusion, he paused to give a characterization to what it is that you experience in the public schools. He says the schools are educating the young for citizenship. So if schools did not protect the rights of students, it would, and here's Jackson's memorable language, it would strangle the free mind at its source and teach youth to discount important principles of our government as mere platitudes. In other words, if you treat school as a mere privilege, which government can provide in a completely authoritarian manner if it wants, we don't honor our supposed commitment to disagreement. We're not even showing the students that we care about it. Okay, this brings us finally, or we're almost there, brings us back to Tinker. In Tinker versus Des Moines, the court quotes Jackson's language that I just read to you from Barnett, and it endorses his vision of public school. In a crucial passage explaining why schools have to tolerate subversive political speech, Justice Fortas writes, quote, any departure from absolute regimentation may cause trouble. A word spoken in class, in the lunchroom, or on the campus may start an argument or cause disturbance. But our Constitution says we must take this risk, and our history says that it is this sort of hazardous freedom, this kind of openness, that is the basis of our national strength. Fortas came back to this point over and over in Tinker. Later on, he basically quotes from Holmes. He says, the classroom is peculiarly the marketplace of ideas. Remember, Holmes was free trade and ideas. The, what happens in your school classroom, that's the free trade and ideas purified. And so if we don't allow dissent there, how are we going to learn to speak responsibly and subversively in the broader world? Okay, so that's the end of chapter three, school speech. You have a right to subversive political speech in public school because public school is a training ground for democracy and the best way to train people for a free trade and ideas is to let them engage in it. But if this is a justification for extending free speech into schools, then it, it suggests some limits on your rights. Now listen here. Speaking freely on whatever topic you wanted, in whatever used words you wanted, could not serve to prepare you for a free trade in ideas. Why? Because schools can't function that way. Nor is it a trade in ideas if one person dominates. I went into Bennett Park Montessori where my daughter goes to school and I was talking about my career as a lawyer and I said, who's the best arguer in the class? And in every single class it would be, uh, it was about, it was, I was talking to the fifth, sixth graders. It was always a girl and she was the loudest, she was the best because she was the loudest. Okay, that's not a free trade in ideas. 
It's not a free trade if you only hear from one person, if one person dominates, okay? Nor is it a trade if the aim is to incite crime rather than inspire thought. Those activities do not further the function of the school, they undermine the school. And the worry that speech is abused by students has led some members of today's Supreme Court away from Jackson's vision of the public school. They've embraced an older vision of public schooling that's based on discipline, order, imparting civility and respect. And that model of the school can claim significant heritage. One does not have to look very deep in our history to find examples of schools operated on these premises. And you must admit, there is value, there's benefit to elevating discipline, order, and civility above all other educational values. But what Jackson saw and what Ms. Tinker showed was that one can respect authority why, while challenging it. You can respect authority while challenging it. One can engage in subversive political speech with the aim of building our community. Seditious speech does not imply a lack of allegiance. It can be an actually a demonstration of allegiance, of a very deep bond of attachment, a kind of love that you have for a people, a group of people, and our shared political project. Okay, so last paragraph. Where does that leave us with regards to the challenging questions I began with? We can wrestle with a lot of these in the discussion afterwards, but I think the guiding question in your mind should be this. Is the speech at issue consistent with the mission of the school? Or does it undermine the mission of the school? Take the student in the Fraser case who was punished for giving a speech full of pretty gross sexual talk. Sexual speech can have a point, but I would say that Fraser's language didn't, and he was basically there to get laughs, and it actually humiliated some of the younger kids in the audience. So basically, Fraser was carelessly victimizing people, and I'm inclined to think that the court got it right by not protecting his speech. Contrast this with bong hits for Jesus, okay? <laughs> bong hits for Jesus. There's no question, I think, that drug use and drug trade threaten schools, no question. But why can't we make that point in debate? The banner did not present a clear and present danger to the school. If one can respond with another banner or with a class discussion, then I think Tinker should have applied and the speech should have been protected. I look forward to discussing these issues with you. Thank you.